welcome to you too. Now, one question I have, uh, it seemed to be some people were having trouble hearing. If you can't hear me, would you hold up your hand? Oh, apparently you can hold That's good. We're good to go, Ron. That was about half a joke. Okay. She didn't catch it. Uh, some people caught it. Good. Uh, welcoming you here this morning is kind of like walking into your living room and saying, Hi, welcome home. Uh, I'm the one who isn't, hasn't been here before, and, and I am grateful for that honking welcome that you gave me. At this point, Jeff is gone to take care of his family, and we don't know yet who God is going to lead to this church to be his next settled minister. That's the term they use, a settled ministry. That means that minister is here from the day they start until they or you or God decides they need to move on. But I am here in that interim. That's why they refer to it as an interim minister. I know that I'm leaving, and that's why I'm here, to serve this church and to work with your committees and in any way I can to help you to select a new settled minister and just flat out work myself out of a job. Over the past few weeks, your board of elders and the leaders of your church and I have come to the conclusion that it is God guiding me to serve in this church at this time between Jeff and your next minister. So I am very happy to be here. I am grateful to God for this call. To give you just a very brief background, I served at Highwater Church up north of Fredonia for 16 years from 91 to 2007. I then went over and served at Grace Church over in Whitehall for eight years from 2008 to 2016 when I retired. I didn't honestly think I would ever get the opportunity to serve another church. But my constant prayer is always, God, lead me and don't be subtle, because I'm not quick on the uptake sometimes. Well, over the past few weeks, the leadership of this church and I have seen some very unsubtle things that have led us to believe and to allow them to call me as your interim minister. Now, it's important to understand that you call a minister. You don't hire a preacher. If you hire a preacher, you get somebody who comes once a week for an hour and regales you with their wit and wisdom. When you call a minister, you invite someone to be the unofficial member of every family in this congregation, to share in your joys and your concerns be with you in times of trials and trial. As Jesus said in John 10, you want to call a shepherd, not a higher hand. And that's why I'm here. I am grateful to you and to God for allowing me to do this. At this time, I would invite you all to join me in a moment of prayer. Gracious and almighty God, we praise you. We praise you for actively guiding us to seek to be the church. We praise you for actively guiding us to seek to be the church of Jesus Christ at 587 Mount Vernon Road. As we gather this morning, we ask that you be present in our midst. You said that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, you would be among them. As we begin our worship together, we claim that promise and recognize that we are in the presence of the creator of the universe. We ask that you still our minds and quiet our hearts, that we may focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
comes first from Psalm 119. It is verses 33 to 44, to 40, excuse me. There we read, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the paths of your commandments, for I delight in them. Turn your heart to your decrees. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanity. Give me the life in your ways. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. See, I have longed for your precepts, and your righteousness give me life. At this time, I would invite you again to join in prayer. Loving and glorious God, we praise you. We praise you for this beautiful morning. We praise you for this opportunity to be your people at this time and at this place. We praise you for new things happening. And we look forward to what you are going to do in all the midst. As we gather, we are mindful of people who are ill or grieving, Karen Carruthers' brother and Dan Beaver's brother passed away on Sunday, Saturday, excuse me, her brother Dan Beaver passed away on Saturday morning. Sylvie Mazgay, Ron Thompson, Frank Keats, a high school team died as a result of the traffic accident. And the Goodridge's daughter, Sarah and family, were returning safely to Mozambique, Washington, D.C. We raise these concerns to you in grieving and in joy. We know that you are with us at all times, and we are grateful. We pray that as we go through this service, continue to be with us, that you will open our hearts to your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This time, I would continue. Oh, it's not technical difficulty at all. It's preacher difficulty. I had things mixed up. Sorry, Patty. We will continue. Our other scripture today comes from Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if 
you're not listened to, take one or two others with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done to you by my Father in heaven. For wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I will be among them. And from the book of Romans, we read, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the love who commits, for the one who commits to love has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandments are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love do, does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now moments for you, to, how now, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than we, when we first became believers. The night is far gone and the day is near. Let us lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and lasciviousness, not in quarrel and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Would you join me now in another moment of prayer? And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning, the main text I'm going to use is from Romans, where Paul talks about the difference between love and law. But for us, it's kind of hard to get a handle on that, because the understanding of the law to the Jews was something quite different than what we understand. So let me give you a little bit of background on that. And specifically, I'm going to go 3,000 years back to King David. King David was the greatest king Israel ever had. He took Israel to the height of power and wealth that it hadn't seen before or since, with the possible exception of the 21st century. The 20th century. King David made his money the old-fashioned way. He killed people. In the Psalms, it says, in the spring of the year, when kings go to war. And that's exactly what kings did back then. They went to war, and whoever won got the spoils. And King David was a magnificent general. And because of that, many people didn't even fight him. They just gave him tribute. Said, here, take our money and leave. And he did. By the time of his death, Israel was at the pinnacle of their existence. Then his son Solomon took over and promptly spent every penny that David had brought in. And he still wasn't done, so of course, as kings do, he started to tax people. And he taxed them pretty heavily. 
so that when he died, his son Rehoboam took over. And Rehoboam brought in the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he told them, I'm now going to be your king. Swear allegiance to me. And they said, not so fast. Particularly the 10 tribes of the northern part of Israel said, we will swear allegiance to you if you will lower our taxes. Where have we heard that lament? Rehoboam went to his father's wise old advisors and they said, it's a good request. Taxes are too heavy. Lower them and keep the kingdom together. He then went to his young princes that he grew up with and they said, Rehoboam, buddy, you're the king. You can do anything you want. And he liked that. So he called the people, the leaders back together and said, if you think my father's taxes were bad, wait till you see mine. And they said, we're out of here. And from that day on, there were two kingdoms of the Israelites. The southern kingdom based in Jerusalem with the tribes of Judah and, and uh, Benjamin. It was known as Judah since Benjamin was very small. And the northern tribe, the other ten tribes, and it was known as the Kingdom of Israel. Well, that continued until 722 BC when the Assyrians came down from up around western Turkey, eastern Iraq, and just annihilated the Kingdom of Israel. Killed or exiled all of the men and literally took the wives. Soldiers stayed and settled, and because of that, by Jesus' day, these people were reviled by the Jews down in Jerusalem because they had intermarried with the Assyrians. They were known as the Samaritans. Well, when the king of Assyria, a guy by the name of, yeah, I actually rehearsed this one, Senator, Senator Gerb, call him Sam for right now. He went down and laid siege to Jerusalem. In 2 Kings we read, that very night the angel of the Lord set out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When morning dawned, they were all dead bodies. Then King Sam of Assyria went home and lived in Nineveh until his two sons and I are assassinated. He was having a bad year. Well, fast forward again to 856 BC and King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was laying siege to Jerusalem again. And the Jews looked at this and said, we've seen this movie before. You see, the Jews were not worried. When Solomon built up Jerusalem, one of the biggest things he did was to build the temple to God. In that temple was the Holy of Holies. The Jews believed that God lived in that temple. And they believed because of that they would never be conquered. Think about it for a minute. If you think you can drive down a few blocks and go over a few blocks and that big building we know as the high school is really the temple of God, how afraid of somebody would you be? Well, there was one person who saw things differently. It was a guy by the name of Jeremiah. And as we learned last week, Jeremiah was a prophet. Not as the song of my youth said, he was bold from. But Jeremiah told the people of Jerusalem, you're going to lose. Nebuchadnezzar is going to win. 
that didn't make him very popular. In fact, he got beat up regularly. He got thrown down an empty system. But as it worked out, he was right. And you can read about all of this in the books of Jeremiah and of Lamentations. The biggest thing that Jeremiah said was that Nebuchadnezzar was not only going to defeat them, he said that Nebuchadnezzar is the agent of God. Now that's really something to hear. But as we'll talk about later today and in future weeks, he was. <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, tore down the walls, butchered a pig on the altar of God, and then tore down the whole temple. No one knows whatever happened to the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. He then took every able-bodied person off into exile. Now, it's important to understand what that means. He did not take them to Babylon and enslave them making bricks like the Pharaoh did. Nebuchadnezzar didn't need a whole nation of slaves. He needed good little Babylonian citizens. But the Jews were a troublesome one. And he knew if he kept them together, they'd rebel. So what he did was he took a few and put them in this town, and a few and put them in that town, and he spread them out from Turkey all through Iraq and Iran and down through the Middle East and to Egypt. And God was working in this people, and we'll see that in the future. Now that was Nebuchadnezzar. However, he also gave us some of the most wonderful stories in the Bible. If you go to the book of Daniel, you'll read about Daniel and the lion's den. That happened during this exile. And you'll read about Meshach, yeah, let me get that right, Shadrach got to start on the right one. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I know the song. In the fiery furnace. Well, Nebuchadnezzar didn't live forever. And he was followed by a couple of his sons. And 70 years after he conquered Jerusalem, the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And their king, and I love this name, was Cyrus the Great. If I ever had a son, I would have named him Cyrus the Great. I think that's just an ideal name for a guy. Well, not only did Cyrus allow the Jews to go back to Jerusalem, he helped pay to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And you read about that in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But think about this for a minute. That was 70 years after they had been exiled. People had settled down. Isaiah, in 1st and 2nd Isaiah, told them, settle down and plant your crops. Now, Cyrus the Great says, you can go home. And a lot of them said, I am home. You want me to go back to great-great-grandma's house? So while some of them did go back to Jerusalem, many stayed where they were. And the result of that was what scholars refer to as the Jewish diaspora. The dispersal, dispersal of the Jews. And God caused that and God used that, as we will find out in future weeks. 
But think about this for a minute. If you were a Jew, and Jerusalem had just gotten destroyed, and the temple was in ruins, and you were being carted across the desert to live in a little town with a few other Jews and to settle down, and wouldn't you start to wonder what was going on? And the Jews did. They wanted to know why God had done this. And they came to a certain conclusion. They concluded that their ancestors had sinned. Now it's kind of convenient when you get punished to know that it was your ancestors who caused problems. But that was their conclusion. In fact, they had a saying that a man has eaten sour grapes and his son's teeth have been put on edge. Well, as a result of this, the returning Jews came to the conclusion that they needed to take what God told them to do more seriously. And because of that, a group of men, and sorry ladies, you weren't invited to this club, a group of men were formed and it grew over the years into a society known as the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were very pious people. They believed that they needed to keep the Ten Commandments of Moses, but they also needed to keep the oral tradition of the Jews. Now, the Ten Commandments, you can kind of get your arms around. The oral tradition of the Jews was another 600 or so rules. And they were designed to allow you to keep the Ten Commandments more easy. For instance, if I were walking down the sidewalk and a woman was coming the other direction who wasn't my wife, I would be required to go to the other side of the street to avoid having adultery with her. That's how those rules work. And before very long, it became very obvious to people that nobody kept all these rules. But the Pharisees were not bad people. If a Pharisee moved in up the street, your property values went up. The problem the Pharisees had, and this happens an awful lot, it is said that self-made men often overconstruct around the mouth, and that's what happened to the Pharisees. They got so intense about doing good all the time that they couldn't help but tell everybody else how good they were. And not only that, that would be bad enough, but they really got a kick out of telling everybody else how bad they were. And that is what Jesus came and told them, no, you shouldn't do that. John the Baptist called them a brood of vipers. Jesus called them hypocrites. They simply misinterpreted what God wanted them to do. God wants love, not legalism. He wants relationship, not rules. Now, when Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, the early church was still struggling with this. In the church in Jerusalem, that at that time was led by Jesus' kid brother named James, not James of James and John, son of Zebedee, which was a different name, but he led the early church until 70 AD, James and the church in Jerusalem believed that in order to be a Christian, you had to follow the law of Moses. You had to be a Jew first. They were called the Judaizers. And Paul, on his mission trips out into the hinterland of the Greek lands, said, no, that's silly. 
All we need to do is understand the love of God. And that's what he was telling us today in our letter from Romans. He said all of the rules in the Moses law, you shall not steal, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, and all the rest are summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I'm sure you've never known anybody who gets kind of legalistic around their faith. And I'm really sure you've never known. But there are people all the time who get in fights over the pettiest stuff. One of my favorite stories about a guy that was shipwrecked on an island. It wasn't a desert island, it was a very plush island. And he didn't lack for food or comfort. But he was there by himself for 10 years until a cruise ship went by and came up on shore to rescue him. And he said, well, before I leave, let me show you around my island. And he took them to his home, very nice hut. And they said, wow, this is pretty comfortable. And one of them looked out the back window and said, what's that big building back there? He said, oh, that's my church. And then he looked a little farther and said, what's that other big building? He said, that's my old church. That's the way we are at times, folks. We're much more concerned about proving we're right on some esoteric theological point than in simply loving one another. And we need to not be that way. And that's what Paul was telling us this morning. And I hope it's what we all know. Could you join me now in a moment? Loving God, we praise you. We praise you for coming to us in that stable in Bethlehem, for living with us and loving us, for teaching us, for allowing yourself to be tortured to death on a cross that you might overcome the grave and open the portal to eternal life through which we might all pass. praise you for the Apostle Paul and others who taught us to love one another. That following you isn't difficult. We pray this week that you will cause us to pause if we find ourselves being the least bit judgmental of someone else. You will cause us to repent and reach out in love. And now, dear Lord, we come to you in a moment of silent prayer. us, Lord, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. By the Lord, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in me.
join me in a prayer in preparation for our holy meal. Gracious and almighty God, we are your people, but we are sinners. We recognize that we have fallen short of your glory. At this time, as we prepare to approach the holy table, we ask that you will forgive us will guide us in the future to be better people, to be your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you, take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 